please give me a hand in welcoming Joshua and to talk about what you need to Thank you, and thanks for staying late. It's getting pretty late, and I think mine is still... Is it the last talk in this room? Nope. No, there will be one after it, it seems. Okay, so uh, thanks again. My name is Joshua, and I will tell you something about a project called Deep Sea, and especially which new features we have. Um, I will start with explaining what Deep, <laughs> Deep Sea actually is, uh, what, um, how does it work, and then I will come to the features. And so DeepSea is a project uh, developed at SUSE where I work. I, I'm one of the main developers for this project. And it was created to deploy and manage Ceph. Um, and it's based on SALT. So we use SALT to actually make it work. I will just explain in a second what SALT actually is. And this is a follow-up talk um, which was given by Jan, which is also the uh, organizer of the, of the SDS room. So thanks, Jan. And yes, so as, a, as promised, um, the SALT is a uh, configuration and remote execution, uh, configuration management and remote, remote execution engine, which is uh, highly extensible with uh, Python. So you can write your own modules, and you can use Jinja for uh, as a templating system. Um, as I said, it, it's it's here to uh, deploy and manage Ceph. Since you're in the software-defined storage room, you basically should know what Ceph is. But I will just give you a very brief introduction. Um, so it's a free. It's basically copy-paste from Wikipedia, so you can, you can read that up as well. Um, it's a free software storage platform, and it, implement, it implements um, object storage on a single distributed cluster, and it provides um, interfaces for all the major um, um, things like object, block, and file. Mm. So how does uh, DeepC work? Um, for that to understand, we basically just need to get some salt concepts, so just to be on the same page. I will make it very quick. Um, basically, we have to know about states. That's what SALT uses to do certain things on a, on a machine, which, for example, like installing a package, configuring whatever service. And there are uh, orchestrations, which allows you to group these states. And so let's say you want to install very a different set of services and want to apply them or whatever, um, you can just group them. It's a very abstracted way to look at things, and that comes in pretty handy for for um, for um, creating such a system. Um, that was wrong. Right. Um, so we use that um, we use that level of orchestration to make concepts of stages. So these concept of stages is something that, that DeepC invents. And it just, it's just a way to look at certain operations um, and, and make them more approachable. So we, we split up um, a complete, um, let's say, so, so we, we, we use this kind of uh, concept of stages to group, um, to group these states or to group operations by topic. And so we have uh, five, or at least we have six stages, to be fair. The last one is, is a bit optional because that actually removes stuff. And so these stages do certain things like stage zero, does a setup of a cluster. It installs all the necessary packages and all that stuff. The second one, uh, the first one does um, a discovery and configuring, but that's not really important. It's just for the record. Um, we should just jump in right into a, a demo just for you to see how things work. This is obviously pre-recorded because I don't want to face the demo gods. It just always goes bad. Um, that is sped up by times three. So in this demo, I will run the just the stage zero just for demoing purposes. They kind of look the same. They just do different things. So here, the stage zero, as I said, is the preparation phase. It takes care of installing everything. So, 
and you can see we are parsing, and I will, I will go into what's actually happening here in, in a second. So here you can see that we also do validations and stuff. So this is how it actually looks like when you, when you deploy a Ceph cluster with DeepC. We have like warnings or when something is green and then it just goes over and does stuff. As I said, it's times three. So I think you get the idea, right? Here it's installing packages, it's syncing, it's, um, it's pushing files back to a minion, it monitors processes and stuff like that. Right, so, and that brings me already to the features. And you just saw, in this demo, you just saw the first feature. So usually, salt isn't very verbose, it's actually very terse in what it's actually showing you. When you, so who of you knows salt? Who of you has worked with salt? Not that many people, so. <laughs> um, when you trigger a command uh, with salt, it doesn't return you anything until it's done. But when it's done, it gives you a nice output and it has like colors in it and it's all good and it gives you a pretty good report. But until that time, it's just showing you nothing. And you, if the operation is bigger, which it is in a, high, in a big cluster, then you, it might be that you wait for <laughs> like 10 minutes and think that it's maybe stuck or then you will abort it and then stuff goes wrong. So there is something like the salt event bus, which you can attach to and then look which events gets emitted and which uh, states are finished, which, uh, and which modules have been executed, and which modules have been successful, and whatnot. So those events, and the, so the event bus is basically, it's, it's nice to look at when you know what's going on, but when you're not really sure, it's super cluttered, and you just can't really read it. So what we did, we wrote a wrapper. Actually, Ricardo wrote a wrapper. He's sitting here. And we evaluate uh, the, the file, so we pre-render all the states because it's, uh, we need to pre-render because it's uh, YAML files templated by Jinja. And then we can, then we can uh, where we get an idea of what the states will execute when we actually run them. And then we attach to uh, the event bus and then we just match the um, states that we just executed with the state that is being sent to the event bus. And that's, that's where we can, uh, that's where we get this representation. So with this, we can actually check um, or give you a better feedback when things actually completed or if they failed right at the moment when they're, when they're executed and not 10 minutes after. Um, Ceph has different the, um, services and those services are usually installed on different nodes so it's kind of it's kind of natural to think in a role based approach mm. those roles are uh, Ceph specific so there are monitors, there are OSDs since two versions, there are also managers, and there's a Radius Gateway, an MDS for CephFS exposure, um, iSCSI, NFS Ganesha, and there was OpenEdit, which is the management framework, which uses Grafana and Prometheus, but I will get to that in a second. So that's a, a concept that uh, DeepSea implements and allows you to specify these roles, which then later and gets, um, gets installed. As I just said, there is uh, there are this um, there are this open attic role which also implements the monitoring side of things. So, but we actually want to split that out because there is uh, the Ceph manager dashboard which is now built into Ceph itself, and that's where the where the data is actually represented. And we just scrape it with uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Um, we also do obviously operations because it's not only there to 
deploy, but it's only there to man it is also there to manage Ceph. So we have also we've so that's that's not a new feature. We have always been able to uh, install various packages, obviously do various basic configurations, um, add new OSD, which is like the object, object storage daemon where data is being processed and decommission the same thing like on an OSD level on the node level. This is basic stuff that you just need to have when you when you want to uh, manage a, a cluster. And we always did updates. So when your um, when your distribution just sends in new updates on iteration over these stages, you get new updates applied. And we also did uh, automated restarts if there is a new kernel. So if it actually <coughs> is required. So we still do updates. Well, it's yeah, we still do it. It's obvious, but we do it a bit more sophisticated now. So. Um, when there are pending updates, we not only just apply them, we also look at them and then we apply them and then we flag certain roles. So for example, if there is an update for one specific service, then we flag the service in the next iteration of one of the stages, only this service will be restarted. If it's required. So we, we, for example, look at the list of open files, and when there is deleted, then we just you know restart the daemon to not run into very bad situations when you restart the daemon after you just applied three major software updates. What we also do, we do, um, so we, Ceph has a configuration, um, and there is only there is only one big configuration, and we internally split that up. So every daemon gets its own configuration. That allows us to track um, configuration changes. So we compute uh, checksums, and then when somebody changes something in a configuration file, we compute, the, we compute the, the checksums and then compare them and restart only the corresponding services on the next stage invocation. So just to be a bit more fine-grained and don't restart everything all the time, even though it's not necessary. Um, what we also added um, are uh, health checks. So the thing is that SALT is very good to run things in parallel. That's nice. Mm. When you want to spin up a cluster, when you're just going from, from zero to a, a running cluster, you can be really fast. You can just ex execute everything at the same time. But when you're operating on a live cluster, you don't really want to execute everything at the same time. Because bad, bad things can happen when you, for example, um, have a bad update in your channel and then you apply it like on all your nodes at the same time. And yeah, I think you know the bad stories of that one. Or you just push the configuration, Missed up the syntax, and then it, everything blows up, and you have outage. All your clients get disconnected, and it just sucks. It's same with kernel crashes, and there is a longer list of things that that can go wrong if you do everything at the same time. That's why we actually moved over to a sequential approach um, with intermediate health checks. So we check for things like is um, the node up and running after you, for example, did a reboot. Um, when you restarted a service, did it come up again? Are the mounts present? Is the system D unit in a, in a proper in a proper state? Um, is of course Ceph's health okay? Because when you restart multiple nodes, you know, it can't complain. And if some of these conditions are not met, we abort the um, the operation the stage, and then you as an administrator can um, interfere. I just talked about monitoring. This is just for the record. We use Prometheus to, to scrape the data. And Grafana is a time series uh, database uh, with neat little dashboards. You can just uh, look at this. Um, there is one more feature, which is um, was tough, and it's still tough. It's migration. And f for those who know Ceph a bit better, um, there is and was file store, which was the de facto standard for a long, long time. It's on this format. And, but the recommendations change over time. So right now it's blue store, and eventually in the future it will be something different. 
in order to get the new latest and coolest on disk format, you uh, kind of have to redeploy your cluster because there is no direct migration path offered from Ceph. So we we also we also tried to find a way to make this less painful redeploying something. So this is why we used this kind of um, controlled way of killing an OSD and and bringing it back up with the new format and in between applying checks and all that stuff so that this is so that we try to be very user friendly. We have also different modes, which is a which is the more aggressive one, which goes a per host operation or a, a bit more careful which goes on a per, on a per node basis, uh, per OSD basis, sorry. We also do upgrades, like from one release of your operating system, currently only OpenSUSE and SUSE, sorry, um, and also of the Ceph version to the next. Also here we leverage um, our approach of sequentially going over each node and being super, super careful of not breaking things by applying basically the health checks after each operation. Um, also a neat little feature which basically sounds horrible in the first place, which is a staged shutdown, but if you want, for example, to have a, a data center move um, from one place to another, you, there is actually a recommended order in which you should shut down your services, and that's why this feature is there. We also apply app armor profiles by default. Uh, TuneD not enabled by default, but we at least ship the we at least ship the profiles. Oh yeah, and so that's a that's a feature. In, that's a bit that's a bit crazy, and <laughs> it was never fun. But so there's this engulf feature. Um, we took the name Engulf because there's a project called Deep Sea and it's the, it deploys Ceph and we tried to be a bit more in this mer team kind of type. And so this feature was implemented to make a non Deep Sea cluster which was um, deployed by whatever Ceph deploy or even manually or Ceph Ansible or whatever and then make it a, a Deep Sea controlled cluster. The tricky part was that everybody put his configuration files wherever he wants and everything was a total mess. And it kind of works now and it's always worth a try if you want to switch over to DeepC. We have a method of doing so. But take it with a grain of, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, it's, it's a pun and it's intended. But this feature is special and you should take it with care. We also, you also can do benchmarks when you uh, spin up your cluster and you have you just bought new hardware, you also want to benchmark it. Um, you can do a baseline benchmark leveraging uh, Ceph Bench. You can do RBD benchmarks with FIO, CephFS also with FIO. Um, one thing that we added too late were uh, unit tests. We just, this, this project evolved out of a prototype and we were kind of late in writing unit tests, but we caught up pretty fast now. Mm. So, but the more important part is that we now have not only unit tests, but also integration on smoke testing. And that, um, and that is actually implemented in Ceph's own testing framework called Toothology. So we have a easy way to uh, define certain uh, parameters. Let's say this, this, um, this distribution, X number of amount of nodes, this kind of uh, services that we want to have and we expect this and this to happen and then it just installs and it's super cool. You should have definitely have a look at Toothology if you want to learn more about Ceph. We can do purging. That's nice if you have a um, a proof of concept cluster when you go to a user, customer, whatever, you just want to show something, tear it down, you mess something up, you buy no hardware, then you just want to test it again, you spin it up, purge it down. And why DeepC is also great for um, proof of concepting is because that it actually requires almost no human intervention because we always 
try to get very sane defaults. There's only one, one step where you have to interfere, and this is uh, step two, before, before stage two, where you actually assign host names to certain roles. And that's what you kind of have to do because we can't really tell or we can't find out what you want to have, right? But that's just, you always have to do that. But otherwise, you can just run through them, and after, depending on, on the size and depending on the speed of your, of your nodes, like 10 minutes later, you have an up and running Ceph cluster. But we, as I said, we rely on saying defaults, but also at the same time, we use salt, which is highly customizable and um, highly configurable, so you can basically do everything on your own. You can even uh, swap out even your own states and just messing with it. It's not really recommended, but you theoretically, you, you can do it. You can do it. It's, uh, the framework is there for it. So that was basically the end of, um, the, end of the features. First of all, I want to thank uh, my, my employer for sending me here and also for supporting the DeepSea project, which is upstream. Um, also want to thank the team, Eric Jackson, who was the original creator, Jan, Tim, Ricardo, and Nathan, which is the guy that mainly uh, was helping us with pathology. And the org mode, for those who don't know, the org mode is a pretty neat little thing of organizing tasks and you can write in org mode um, a presentation and uh, export it as a reveal.js presentation, which this presentation is. Um, so, and you can find it here. All the links, the links to the deep sea, it's under the, the SUSE namespace, my slides, and my GitHub email address. And with that, thanks for your attention, and um, I'm done. Question. No? Oh. One? Do you have any plans for more advanced uh, cluster management like uh, crash map manipulation uh, or like? So the question is if we have more plans <laughs> to add more sophisticated um, features like crash map manipulation. That's not the scope of of this project, I would say. There is a crush map editor, or will be a crush map editor in the Ceph Manager dashboard, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe. Maybe. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> you see, there will be one, but that's, that won't be probably not the deep, not deep seas uh, land. I think right now there's a separation of using deep sea to deploy the actual cluster and then use the dashboard for the time configuration of the individual objects within the cluster. Right. Good. Thank you.